Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our second uh, and final day of the Kerry Civil War Conference. Uh, my name is Bridget McAuliffe, and on behalf of myself and my co-organisers, Owen O'Shea and Dr. Mary McAuliffe, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here today, both in person and online. Uh, we would like to thank our partners, UCD Gender Studies, Kerry County Council, Kerry Library and the Department of Computing, Creative Media and Information Technology at Munster Technological University, Kerry Campus. The Kerry Civil War Conference is supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sports and Media under the Decade of Centenaries Programme 2012 to 2023. Uh, I would like to ask everybody, I know you've been asked already, but maybe double check that your phones are off or on silent, please. Uh, staff from Sheem Satira are throughout the building during the day if you have any questions or queries about the facilities or directions within the building. We had an excellent day of talks yesterday, and I have no doubt that there is an equally thought-provoking series of presentations, panel sessions and keynote address and roundtable in store for all of us here today until quarter to six this evening. So we have a really full day and a very exciting day ahead of us. Our first panel session will run until quarter past 11 and you will have a 30 minute break then. Teas and coffees will be available in the foyer for you to purchase. We're in the auditorium, uh, back in the auditorium at quarter past 11 for the next session, which lasts until quarter to one. We have a lunch break then for one hour and return for our third and final conference keynote address at quarter to two. At quarter to three, we have a 15 minute comfort break and our sixth and final panel session of the conference will begin at three o'clock and run until half past four. Following a 15 minute break, we will have our conference round table and that will run until quarter to six. The conference exhibition, Michel Lamas, is on view in the Shimsa Gallery, and we would encourage you to uh, go and visit that during your breaks or in the evening, as it's an outstanding production by the students of MTU, Kerry Campus, and Kerry College here in Tralee. O'Mahony's bookshops will be selling books by many of our speakers during the breaks today. Their pop-up shop, shop is located in the entrance foyer. Tonight, our final night, our concert, Their Memory Will Endure, Civil War in Kerry, will begin at eight o'clock here in Shimsa. If you uh, wish to buy tickets, you can buy them here in the box office or online. And it promises to be a fantastic night of Civil War music, Civil War inspired music, song, poetry, and drama. The, the book of the same name, written or edited by Gabriel Fitzmaurice and Padraig O'Cruhu, will also be on sale in the foyer tonight. Uh, that's a separate pop-up shop, but it'll be there when, um, when the concert is on. So now for today, it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to the chair of our first panel, Dr. Bill Kassan of the London School of Economics. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to chair this session on the civilian and socio-economic impacts of the Civil War. We've got three speakers. Each of them will speak for about 20 minutes. The first, which I'd like to introduce, is Dr. Fanula Walsh, who is an assistant professor of modern Irish history in UCD, also author of a prize-winning book, Irish Women and the Great War. Um, thanks, thank you very much, Bill, and um, thank you very much to Mary, Owen, and Bridget um, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, it's a great pleasure to do so. I'd also like to thank um, them for their wonderful organisation of this conference, um, and also to Shimsha Tira for their wonderful hospitality over the last couple of days. Um, it's been a wonderful event so far. In the late 1930s, Eileen Hussey, a schoolgirl in North Kerry, collected information from William Casey about his memories of the tragedy at Clashmelkin Caves in April 1923. During the Civil War, Casey was a senior figure in the, in the local company of the Kerry Brigade, and so he was very familiar with the events that he was recalling. Preserved in the National Folklore Collection, the entry describes in detail the events of the siege and also its tragic aftermath. Eileen Hussey's notes also mention that the caves have become a site of pilgrimage for visitors from all parts who come by by every mode of convenience, the motor car, the trap car, and the bicycle motor and pedal to see the famous caves and if possible, to get into them, to see where this noble little band of six Republicans, 
put up such a gallant fight against hundreds of Free State soldiers for three days and three nights. The events at Clash Melkin are also memorialised in song. In the late 1930s, the lyrics of one such song were tra carefully transcribed by Cahal Manchal, a teacher at a school in Dromnakura. The song refers to the men giving their lives for Ireland down by the Shannon shore in a noble fight, but acknowledges that hearts will feel sore and that will be for years to come for the friends and family of those who are lost. In this paper, I want to discuss what happened at Clash Malkit in those days of April 1923 and how the events there resonated with families in the local community for decades afterwards. For those who aren't familiar with Clash Malkin, um, this map taken from the Atlas of the Irish Revolution might give you some sense of where it is um, um, in the north of Kerry. Um, I should probably say here that my interest in Clash Malkin is personal as well as academic. I grew up in Kildare, but my father is from Clash Malkin, or as we knew it as Clash. I have many happy memories of visiting my grandparents, Michael and Bridie Walsh, on their farm in the townland. We often walk the short distance down the road to the cliffs or stopped at the memorial to read the inscription. And so when I began as an academic working on this period of Irish history, I kept being drawn back to this story and wanted to learn more. My interest has only deepened the more I've researched, and it's great to have this opportunity to present some preliminary findings with you today. On 15th of April, six members of the local anti-treaty IRA learned that the Free State Army was seeking to capture them. They decided to hide out at the caves at Clash Malkin. The men were led by Timothy, Aeroplane, or Aero Lions, from Kilflynn, and included men who grew up very close to the caves, such as Tom Grah. The caves had been used as a hiding place for men and ammunition during the War of Independence, and they felt it was a safe location. However, the Free State Army had arrested Jim McGrath, another member of the, of the gang, a local IRA man, and a brother of Tom McGrath. During his imprisonment in Tralee, he named the caves as a possible hideout, but he did not know that that was the one his comrades had indeed chosen. He was forced to lead the army to the cave. There were six men hiding there, Aero, Flynn, Aero Lyons from Kill Flynn, Tom McGrath of Clash Melkin, and his cousin Pat, Mac Pat O'Shea, Edward Greeny of Bally Duff, James McHenry of Sleeve Roger, and an English man who was known to them as Reginald Hatway, although, as we learned yesterday, his actual name was Reginald Stenning, who deserted the British Army to join the IRA during the War of Independence. They brought rifles, but no food supplies, believing that they'd just be there overnight. On the morning of 16th of April, the Free State Army brought James McGrath to the cave, where he joined the others hiding there. Four Free State soldiers descended the cliff base and attempted to enter the cave but they're fired on by the men inside. Two of the Free State soldiers were shot and the others retreated. Private James O'Neill was killed instantly, but Lieutenant Harry Pearson initially survived a severe leg injury. However, the efforts by the Free State Army and the Red Cross to recover O'Neill's body and to bring Pearson to safety were thwarted by the constant firing from the men hiding out. It was several hours before Pearson could be rescued and given medical attention. Two of the men hiding in the cave attempted to escape at night. Tom McGrath and Patrick O'Shea, but they were drowned and lost at sea. Their bodies were never recovered. The next morning, mines were detonated, which could be heard miles away, followed by gunfire. The old attempted to smother the men in the cave by sending down burning hay and turf and sheets covered in petrol, but the wind blew the smoke out of the caves. On the morning of 18th of April, two days after the siege had begun, Aero Lyons indicated he was willing to surrender, likely hoping it might spare the lives of the remaining men. A rope was lowered and he began climbing it up the cliffs. However, the rope broke or was cut and he fell to the rocks below. The soldiers above fired at his body, ensuring that he died. Some hours later, the surviving volunteers, McHenry, Hathaway, Greeny and James McGrath, surrendered and were brought to Tralee. They were charged with involvement in the robbing of Ballyduff Post Office and the burning of the Civic Guard station at Ballyhigh, as well as responsibility for the deaths of Pearson and O'Neill. A Freeman's Journal article from 26th of April 1923 reported that Greeny, McHenry and Hathaway all blamed Aero Lines for firing on the Red Cross and claimed that they'd been forced to join the anti-treaty IRA and threatened with being shot if they disobeyed. However, there's no other evidence to support these claims. As noted by the law expert Sean Enright, the intent of the article was to discredit the anti-treaty cause. An article in Antuglock, the Free State Army newspaper, in June 1923, also tried to depict the events at the cave in a more sympathetic light for the National Army. The article describes it as a story of heroic deeds on the wild Kerry coast. It focuses on the suffering of Pearson and the Red Cross coming under fire from the rebels. And as noted by Richard McGalligot yesterday, it describes their reliance being mortally wounded 
while he was endeavouring to get away from the cave. No mention of the rope, though that part is not generally disputed. McHenry, Hathaway and Greeny were all executed in Tralee on 25th of April. In the meantime, Harry Pearson had died of his injuries, bringing the total death toll of the events at the cave to eight. James McGrath was the sole survivor, and perhaps unsurprisingly, he found it difficult to discuss the events afterwards. In his last letter to his brother, Father Tom, Jim McHenry referred to the events at the caves as something awful, but gave no more detail. His thoughts were focused on those he was leaving behind. He does not protest his innocence, nor attempt to place any blame on anyone else. Instead, he says, I'm proud I'm dying as, as a soldier of the Irish Republic. The executions of Greeny, Hathaway and McGrath were the last authorised executions to take place in Kerry. Only a few days later, the end of the civil war was announced. This lent a particular futility to the death so close to the end of the conflict. An end to fighting was generally welcomed in North Kerry. Owen O'Shea has observed that public opinion had shifted towards a longing for peace as the war had dragged on, despite the public revulsion at the atrocities committed by the Free State soldiers. In early 1923, a member of the Listowel IRA noted that the Causeway district was getting tired and the people wanted the IRA to stop the fighting. Owen O'Shea is located in other missile headquarters, which claimed that some farmers in North Kerry welcomed the death of air lines at Clashmelkin Caves, but they were cautious about expressing this. With peace, however, came the need to take stock and find means of coping with the horrors that had happened. Those living in Clashmelkin were faced with daily reminders of what they'd experienced on those days in April 1923. In her 1924 book, Dorothy McCardle described how at night time, the cliff face of Clash Melkin becomes like a tomb or a place of mourning for Ireland's dead. In spring 1924, the writer and Republican activist Dorothy McCardle traveled around Kerry, gathering stories of the Civil War experiences. These are published later that year as the book Tragedies of Kerry, and as a keynote later today by Dr. Leanne Lane, which will go into more detail on that book. The chapter on Clash Melkin is drawn from the experience of Capture McHenry, sister of Jim. Described by a family member some years later as a witness to the slaughter at Clash Melkin, Catherine spent the siege at the top of the cliff waiting for news. Significant detail is provided in McArdle's book on the efforts to smoke the men out and we get some sense of how the siege might have been experienced by those living nearby. She describes how soldiers were sent to every cottage to take out the hay, which is then thrown with smoking sods of turf into the mouth of the caves. Sheets were taken next from the local houses and saturated with sulphur and set on fire, but before being thrown down, a roaring blaze rose in yellow smoke. The people thought the rocks themselves would be consumed. Some of those living locally tried to help the trapped men. Dila Slattery, Slattery living in Clashmelkin and a member of Cumminamon, wrote in a pension application that she suffered a lot at the time of the Clashmelkin caves. And a referee, William Casey, noted that she did all she could for the men in the caves tried to get them out and was held up by the Free State soldiers. When the rebels were brought up from the caves, they were initially brought to the home of the Harringtons nearby, where they were given dry clothes and allowed to warm themselves by the fire. Jim McHenry's wife and his little son were brought to him at the house for a farewell, as they all knew that they would meet their death soon after. Catherine saw on her brother's face the look of a man facing a hard death. He and his fellow prisoners, however, may have been relieved to learn that they would face the firing squad and an official execution rather than a repeat of the particularly grotesque fate endured by other IRA men in Bally Sidi just a few weeks previously. As attendees at this conference will be well aware, eight IRA prisoners were killed by being tied to a landmine at Bally Sidi on 7 March 1923. Extreme brutality had become almost normalised in Kerry in early 1923 after years of conflict and the men hiding out in Clash Malkin would have known that they could expect no mercy if captured. While awaiting execution, Jim McHenry wrote letters to several of his family members, including his wife, his mother, sisters, brothers and nephew. Photographs of these letters were kindly shared with me via, by the McHenry family via my aunt Tess Walsh. There are moving reminders that this IRA rebel was a beloved father, husband, son, brother and uncle. He expressed concern for the welfare of his wife, Hannah, and his son, Harry, referred to as Sonny in the letters. He described them as his pride and joy and asked that they be looked after by his family. Do not forget my good wife and darling child. He tells his wife that it was breaking his heart to think of them both and that he would not feel it so much if it was not for her and my lovely child. His widow, Hannah, faced difficult times in the aftermath of his death. Her son was just two years old. Jim's mother died soon after, and his sister Catherine was also dead within two years. 
Hannah was now dependent on the support and goodwill of Jim's other siblings. Hannah Halloran, Jim's sister, had returned to the family home in Slivodra to help her family who were all suffering from shock. She settled back on the family land and although she gave Jim's widow £450 on the urging of her mother, the widow Hannah to move on with her child, writing later, I lost my place at that time owing to my husband's debt. She later purchased a holding after Martin. In a letter to the Pensions Board in 1953, she described how her life wasn't much after Jim's death. She received a widow's pension from the Department of Defence, but she struggled to raise her son on it. Edward Greeney's adoptive mother also faced difficulties and compensated for his death. Edward, sometimes referred to as Ned, was just 21 when he was executed. His father had died when he was small, and his mother, Mary Dalton, had emigrated to New Zealand, leaving him to be raised by his cousins, the Quinlans of Valley Duff. His mother had been shipwrecked en route to New Zealand, and so it was some years before she was able to make contact with the family in Valley Duff. And so, when she did, they believed that she was an imposter, having been assured that she was dead. Um, the, the story of, the, of um, Mary Dalton and her, and her son is something I think that would make an excellent novel. Elizabeth Quinlan attempted to claim a pension, arguing that she'd raised Edward, had fed and clothed him, but she was turned down as she was considered not eligible to benefit under the, under the Army Pensions Act, as she's not one of the persons mentioned. There was, she mentioned in her pension application that there'd been no account of his mother um, since he had died. Um, at the time of Thomas McGrath's death, he left behind a 70-year-old father and eight siblings. One of these was um, Jim McGrath, age 23. He'd witnessed his brother and cousin tie their boots and rifles across their shoulders and try to swim to the next cave before they were lost at sea. While he was the only one at the cave to escape execution, he was badly beaten while imprisoned afterwards and spent time in hospital. He was believed to have never fully recovered. Their father, Peter, was denied a pension because it's not proven that he was at all dependent on his son when Tom was killed and his means at time of application exceeded the maximum amount. They were a farmer's family with 16 acres. He's very upset by this, warning that my family always back the government. My family won't back it anymore if I'm not paid the same as the rest of the people were. And this, is, I think, highlights one of the difficulties for farming families at the time in proving that their son had been a financial support to the family. So in many cases, the sons worked on the farm and that their, their labor was a, sort of built into the, the family finances um, proving this afterwards was quite difficult for many families. In 1961, Tom and James's sister Mary um, received a dependence pension based on the loss of her brother Tom and the difficult circumstances she found herself in in the 1950s and 1960s. She'd objected to being denied a pension previously, arguing that others in the area had got money and they'd no one killed belonged to them. To the say my brother was killed in Clash Milk and Caves and I got nothing out of them is more wrong than right. And this is something also that you see a lot in the pension applications, a sense of unfairness and injustice, that others had got something and they had not. Peter McGrath's appeal for a pension partly um, outlined a sense of unfairness that he experienced and was likely affected by the fact that he knew that their cousin's family, the O'Shea's, had received compensation, that Patrick O'Shea's father had. Older Patrick's um, brother, John, um, also failed his application and wrote in the 1955, demanding to know what you mean by giving one relative a pension and cutting another relative out of a pension. Didn't my brother lose his life for Ireland as well as any other one? Mary McGrath never married and in the 1950s she was living at the family home in Clash Malkin with her brothers Jim and Michael, who also never married. Jim McGrath lived until 1972, remaining on the family home in Clash Malkin, a quarter of a mile from the caves but never walking down to the site of the siege ever again. The family farm fell into ruin after the siblings died. There is now a plaque there marking the birthplace of John, Tom and Tim McGrath. I do not have time here to go into detail on the experiences of, all the, of the families of all the other men killed and their battles for financial compensation, but similar stories of poverty, grief and a sense of abandonment by a government prevail in the accounts. I will, however, say something briefly about the family of one of the Free State soldiers who was killed, as they also suffered greatly. I've not found much information about Harry Pearson. His remains were brought from Tralee to Limerick for burial, where his parents lived, and we know he was not married. 
but there's little else that we have uh, that I found so far. James O'Neill from Dublin was just 19 when he died. His mother Jane, a charwoman, was apparently very badly off a year after his death and was solely dependent on the government for assistance. Her husband John had died in November 1924 in Grange Gormer Mental Hospital. He had served with the Irish Citizen Army in the Easter Rising and had fought with Cahill Brua on the Republican side at the outset of the Civil War. He was imprisoned in 1922 but suffered from delusional insanity on his release and was committed to Grange Gorman. We cannot but imagine that the news of his son's death in April 1923 in Kerry took its toll on his health and brought great suffering to both parents. James O'Neill is buried in Glasnevin and for many years he and Harry Pearson were almost forgotten in Kerry. Historian Anne Dolan has noted how there are few free state memorials in Kerry concluding that the county had run too red with Republican blood. She wrote that the people who'd watched them die had no wish to recall them. In the aftermath of civil war, Irish society had to rebuild life, life and some silences were necessary for that. The end had been reached, there was no need to reminisce about the means. Both sides had done terrible things and both sides knew it. Commemorating the free, loss, free, free state losses was more challenging than that of the anti-treaty side. The local memory of the acts of cruelty committed by the uniformed army dominated the narratives of the conflict afterwards. In July 1950, a Celtic Cross memorial was unveiled at Clash Malkin. It was reported in detail in the Kerryman. 6,000 people marched on Sunday to Clash Malkin Caves, not far from Ballyduff, for the unveiling of a splendid Celtic Cross memorial to six soldiers of the Irish Republic who made a last stand there 27 years ago. Scarta Glynn and Lixnaw pipe bands led a mile-long parade of IRA, Cumann Amon, Fina Erin, and the general public from Clash Cross. Delivering the oration in Gaelic and English, Mr. John Joe Sheehy graphically recalled the whole tragic episode and urged younger generation to fight for Irish freedom to carry it to a successful conclusion. In 1973, the Bally Duff Sinn Féin Club and Republicans in North Kerry came together to produce a short booklet to mark the 50th anniversary. The intent of the booklet was explicitly political, drawing connection between the events of 1923 and the ongoing troubles in Northern Ireland. Made a holding of this commemoration refueled the fires of patriotism in the hearts of the comrades of this time, many of whom are here today. May the younger people see clearly the road that lies before them. May they realise that there is an exact parallel in the attacks being made on their efforts today as were made on Aero Lines and his comrades 50 years ago. The same old tactics, the same old enemies, foreign and domestic. In 2003, the North Kerry Republican Committee published a booklet containing a detailed account of the events at Clash Malkin, with information on the man killed, including the two Free State Army soldiers, photos of the area and lyrics of songs about the events. The committee aimed for the publication to preserve and honour the memory of our patriot dead, so that future generations will inherit our proud and glorious past. But perhaps rather than recalling a proud and glorious past, we can reflect on the lasting legacies of trauma and loss from those days at Clash Malkin in April 1923. The horrors of men swimming out to sea in the dark after a day being bombarded from above, or watching from the cave as her comrade fell to his death from a broken rope, his body riddled with gunfire, and knowing the same fate might await them, or that of Harry Pearson lying on the exposed rocks bleeding out from a gunshot wound for hours. James O'Neill's mother in Dublin, learning the news of her young son, who's barely a teenager, of his death in the Clash Malkin, and suffering the loss of her husband not long after. We think of the parents and siblings who suffered emotionally but also financially with the loss of their son's income or his contribution to the family farm. The little child growing up without his father and his mother endured hardship, his mother endured hardship and grief, or the experience of young Catherine McHenry, the witness to the slaughter, who was dead within two years, or Jim McGrath, the sole survivor, who was never over the effects of it. I also think of my late grandfather Michael Walsh who was a child of five living in Clash Malkin near the cliffs in April 1923. His family were not directly involved, but they cannot have been untouched by what was happening around them, with the local homes raided for hay, turf and sheets to use in the smoking out, and the noise of guns, mines and grenades echoing around the townland. Indeed, in his final months, my grandfather mentioned repeatedly hiding under the table when soldiers came to raid the house. He dwelt on that time in his final illness, his wandering mind perhaps experiencing that fear all over again. As we approach the centenary of those events, we can remember all of those caught up in the violence and the tragedy of those years of turmoil and the lasting pain for those involved. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Fanula. Um, continuing on the, the theme of um, the experience of Kerry during the Civil War, our second speaker is Kieran McNulty, who is originally from Birmingham, but um, is now a resident of Tralee, and has spent a long time doing research and writing on the working class history of Kerry, and he's going to speak on the subject of class, gender, and labor during the Civil War in Kerry. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Mary, Bridget, and Owen for <coughs> organizing this splendid uh, <coughs> um, conference. And um, my, um, as I said there, the title of my talk is Class, Gender, Labor, and Civil War in Kerry. 1921 to 1923. <clears throat> this paper aims to analyse the response of Labour and Cumna Man to the extrajudicial executions of Republican prisoners by the National Army, and will also analyse the broader working class opposition to the Free State. It will pose the question, by accepting the treaty, was Labour complicit in the actions of the Free State? The historian Gavin Foster questions whether the Free State constituted a bourgeois counter-revolution against the Republican goals, which naturally aligned with the interests of the working class. And he concludes, subsequent scholarship has found little evidence to support such a black and white picture of the conflict's messy class dynamics. Though many historians generally concur that the free state government drew its staunchest support from the middle class, large farmers, and other pillars of the Irish establishment. Sociologist Kieran Allen argues, however, that behind the symbols and mythology of the abstract republic, there was an important point at issue. The anti for the anti-treatyites who sensed their former comrades were accepting a dependency relationship with their imperial foe. In contrast to Foster's thesis, Allen suggests that while the free state claimed that they were merely restoring law and order, it was an order where the poor knew their place and where there would be no more talk of land redistribution or better conditions for workers. With the first shot of the Civil War, the Irish counter-revolution had begun. Labour and the Civil War in Kerry. In February 1922, the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress, ILPTUC, took a decisively pro-treaty position. According to Labour historian Emma O'Connor, Thomas Johnson, leader of the Labour Party, now believed the revolution was over, a constitutional settlement promised the end of the national question with an open road to normal class politics. However, I contend that the Labour leadership came to this conclusion when not martial law was declared on the 10th of December 1920 and the ILPTUC called an end to the railway boycott and indeed any other form of industrial action. <clears throat> After Republicans occupied the forecourts, the ILPTUC called the one-day general strike against militarism, but the strike was widely viewed as anti-Republican. In the general election of June 1922, Sinn Féin's pro- and anti-treaty factions concluded a pact, which saw eight unopposed Sinn Féin TDs being returned for Kerry, <coughs> including Austin Stack amongst the five anti-treaty members returned. Labour won 17 out of the 18 seats it contested, nearly matching the vote for the anti-treaty Sinn Féin. But it ran no candidates in Kerry. The reasons behind this decision are unclear. In May, the Kerry people reported a letter from the Secretary of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, ITGWU, Tralee Branch, Jeremiah Murphy, of the Tralee Workers' Council, TWC, stating that the members of the branch were of opinion that it would be it would not be advisable to put forward a Labour candidate at the coming election. The Council accepted this position even though the ILPTUC stated that finances would be forthcoming in the event of a candidate being put forward. And the Irish Teachers' Organisation, INTO, had granted the sum of £500 for the election. In an attempt to promote peace, on the 24th of July 1922, the Kerry Farmers' Union called a peace meeting in Tralee. In attendance were members of Tralee Harbour Board and two representatives of the Labour Party, a Mr Fleming from Kilcommon and a Mr Breen from Kiltalar, along with Commandant H. Murphy of the National Army. The meeting passed a resolution expressing a desire to restore peace and wired it to the government.
executions. Kerry fell to the National Army in August 1922, and soon after the dial passed the Army Special Powers Resolution, allowing for the introduction of military courts of tribunal and the executions policy. The Army launched a campaign of executions for Republican prisoners, including 17-year-old Bertie Murphy of Castle Island by David Nelligan, who was the brother of Kerry ITGWU official Morris Nelligan. As was said earlier in this conference, David was originally a member of Michael Collins' squad, which subsequently formed the officer corps of the Dublin Guard. At the beginning of 1923, Brigadier General Paddy Daly, also of the Dublin Guard, assumed responsibility for the Kerry Command, subsequently characterising his conduct in the county in suitably brutal terms. Nobody asked me to take kid gloves, so I didn't. In March 1923, the army was responsible for the massacre of 25 Republican prisoners in Kerry, and the official inquiry into the Ballyseedy massacre stated, the allegations submitted to the court, particularly with reference to the maltreatment of prisoners, are untrue and without foundation. In view of the abnormal conditions which prevailed in, the, in this area, the discipline maintained by the troops is worthy of the highest praise. Labour was under increasing pressure to take a stand in defence of Republican prisoners. The Chicago Federation of Labour messaged Kahala Shannon, Labour TD, referring to barbarous killings of prisoners and urged him to resign from Parliament in protest. In Kerry, a Lieutenant McCarthy of the Dublin Guard informed Johnson that he had witnessed what he called murder and resigned in protest from the army. And a publican in Karasavine stated he overheard soldier, a soldier named Griffin boasting he shot prisoners on their knees. And on the, 18th, on the 17th of April, Johnson raised the Kerry killings in the dial, saying, I urge that this inquiry that has been made in, by a court and consisting of three military officers should not be accepted as finally closing these incidents. The Doyle and the military have no right to assume that every prisoner who has been arrested is guilty of an offence. The Minister for Defence, Richard General Mulcahy, gave his by now standard reply to Johnson, saying he was quite satisfied that the occurrences were thoroughly investigated and that the findings were correct, and expressed his fullest confidence in the inquiry's findings. He also refused Johnson's request to bring forward evidence that was produced at those inquiries. When Johnson asked Minister for Home Affairs Kevin O'Higgins, is it still possible to hold an inquest? O'Higgins replied, I see no factor that would make it impossible. Whether there were factors that would make it desirable would be a matter for consideration. Johnson's request got no further than the Dial Chamber. Republicans had no faith in what they called murderers who tried themselves and suggested that if Johnson be honest in his desire to investigate the Ballyseedy crime, he will make a journey to Tralee where he will be able to satisfy himself whether the tragedy was murder or accident. Johnson never took the Republicans up on their offer. After the Civil War, the government passed the Indemnity Act 1923, which stipulated that all sentences passed of military prisoners were of military prisoners before the passing of the Act were, were, were retrospectively valid and indi this indicated an, an acknowledgement by the Free State authorities that they were acting illegally. The Catholic Church, Common Oman and the Civil War in Kerry. The Catholic hierarchy lent its full moral force behind the treaty. On New Year's Day 1922, at all masses throughout Kerry, the prayers for the congregation were asked for the ratification of the treaty. Republicans were determined to undermine the influence of the church, dismissed by Republican socialist Padre O'Donnell as a feudal remnant. In Kerry, IRA member Seamus O'Connor also told a priest what would happen if he would ever so preach against us again. Women were in the forefront of Republican attempts to challenge the official discourse, fracturing traditional modes of deference in the process. Comnaman was overwhelmingly against the treaty. By November 1922, 17 members of Comnaman had been arrested in Tralee alone. They were militantly opposed to the Catholic Church's anti-Republican propaganda. On the 27th of August 1922, at Sunday Masses in Killarney Cathedral, a letter from the Bishop of Kerry, Charles O'Sullivan, was read, which accused the IRA of being in utter conflict with the moral law and of military despotism and immoral usurpation of and confiscation of the people's rights, prompting one Cumnaman member from Kenmare to promise to no longer hear mass and listen to insulting remarks. In While Cumnaman and Kerry 
avoided involvement in social issues, the nurse Governor Navuda represented an exception. Born into a Unionist and Church of Ireland family, she won a seat for Sinn Féin on Kerry County Council and fiercely opposed the treaty. However, she also campaigned for a hospital in Tralee and for a public programme of health education on the dangers of sex sexually transmitted diseases and for mental health institutions to no longer be referred to as lunatic asylums. Navruda also helped win trade union representation for the nursing profession, declaring that it's full time that we nurses take our rightful place amongst the workers of the world in fraternal organisation. And just the, the first branch of this organisation was set up in Tralee in, in 1919. And, it, and obviously it was overwhelmingly women who were nurses. Despite their considerable contribution to the Republican cause, Cumnamar's marginalisation was due largely to, its, to the organisation's failure to address the issues of class and women's oppression. According to historian Margaret Ward, Cumnamar failed to realise its radical potential because of its, its emotional and ideological identification with nationalism, preventing them from ever developing a strategy which could have encompassed the broader definition of liberation. I'll now move on to the issues around industrial action. In 1921 to 1923, there was also a number of important national strikes, including on the, the railways, the docks, and the postal service. Of these, the most significant was the postal strike. Unlike the Republicans, organized labor had the potential to establish a workers' republic. Few opportunities existed during the Civil War to achieve this objective, but the strike by members of the Irish Postal Union provides a glimpse of just what might have been possible. The dispute over cuts to bonus payments began on the 9th of September 1922. What makes the militancy of the strikers so impressive was that not only were 10,000 workers on strike for three weeks during the Civil War, but the action was in defiance of a government policy banning civil servants from taking strike action. And to just put that in perspective, if you look at it today, um, the population of the country is 5 million. That would be 16,000 workers on strike for three weeks. It would be significant today in the middle of a civil war whether a ban from going on strike, that's quite incredible. And males had been sent to Tralee, but had been returned. The men on the boats refused to handle them. The Irish examiner noted that all the indoor staff at Tralee post office were on strike. However, referring to the IRA's campaign of cutting telegraph wires, the Irish Independent commented, telegraphic communications from Tralee ceased more than a fortnight ago owing to the continuous cutting of wires, so that the postal strike does not make matters very much worse as far as Kerry is concerned. The Irish Examiner, however, contradicts this account by claiming that the postal strike had added to the trouble in Kerry. The potential for joint strategy by Republican and Labour was a remote possibility. Neither movement recognised the potential for, of such a strategy. Unlike the strike, unlike Sorry, ultimately the strike was undermined by the failure of the ILPTUC to organise solidarity action. The postal workers were thus forced to accept significant pay cuts, agreeing in 1924 to a ban on industrial action, which was not lifted until the 1940s. The defeat of the workers' movement. The Labour Party in Kerry in the general election of August 1923 ran two candidates. Cormac Brannock, former president of the INTO, and Patrick Casey of the Bakers Union and president of the TWC. Brannock declared the ideal of Labour was a workers' republic and they would use any means except the gun to obtain their goal. In reality, this was mere rhetoric. Nationally, the results represented a reversal for Labour. While the, Labour's, while the number of seats in the Doyle increased from 128 to 153, the party's representation in the chamber fell from 18 to 14. Labour's share of the national vote fell by half to 10.6% and in Kerry to 7.9%. A crucial factor in Labour's performance in the election was its failure to address the issues of that which led to the Civil War. By 1923 in Kerry, only seven of the ITGWU branches survived, down from 19. In conclusion, therefore, I would argue that by entering the dial, Labour legitimised the Free State. The marked moderation of the party's leaders appeared matched only by the Republican myopia concerning the working class struggle. For Liam Mellows, Labour had betrayed the Irish Republic, the Labour movement and, uh, in Ireland and the cause of the, <coughs> of the workers and peasants throughout the world. However, towards the end of his life, O'Donnell argued 
that social and economic concerns were declared outside the scope of the Republican struggle. The Republican movement, movement was inspired by pure ideals. The Republican struggle could represent itself as a democratic movement of mass revolt without any danger to the haves from the have-nots. An alternative socialist leadership did not exist due partly to James Connolly and Jim Larkin's adoption of syndicalism. This led the, the union bureaucracy to focus on the idea of one big union, but failed to establish a party committed to fighting for a workers' republic in opposition to both imperialism and capitalism and to defeating a counter-revolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, um, the idea behind our exhibition is really um, quite simple, just to take 10 objects, tell their stories, and the stories of the people associated with them. The time frame um, of the decade was chosen to set the events of the Civil War in context and to explore its aftermath, and the end date of 2028 um, suggested itself naturally because it takes us up to the... Um, to the centenary of the Ash Memorial Hall, the building which now houses the museum. <clears throat> we were um, actually very lucky in 2021 to have the services of the historian in residence um, that year, the Kerry County Council historian in residence, Tom Dillon, um, who researched a number of the objects for us. So I'd just like to, to uh, acknowledge um, his input into it. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, the support of the Department of Arts and Heritage and the, the commemorations unit there who have supported us on a number of projects over the last few years. Um, so an object um, collects layers of information. There's the thing itself, its physical attributes, the, the people who used it, the society and culture um, it was part of. And the passage of time can also change how, objects are, uh, how an object is viewed. And it can take on different meanings um, for different people. And it's notable also that seven of the ten objects came uh, into us directly from the families associated with them. Meaning that they contain their, uh, within them, those objects contain within them the memories, the thoughts, the feelings of several generations of, of those families. And that becomes part of the story as well. Now, some of those objects have been with us for many years. Um, some have come in quite recently. And I'm just going to be glad to know, take you to just three of them today. Um, if you want to know what the other seven are, you're going to have to come and visit the exhibition when it's open, um, hopefully by the end of March, the beginning of April. So the first one uh, is um, not the most uh, exciting looking object, but it's a diary. And it was kept by 17-year-old Christy O'Grady throughout 1921. Um, and so I'm saying it's part of our uh, attempt to set, set the period in context. So this is one of the objects that's been in the collection for many years, having been donated in 1994. And again, I'd like to acknowledge previous research here done in, uh, carried out into Christy and his diary by Ryle Dwyer, um, and also uh, Jude O'Gorman, one of our museum volunteers. So Christie's diary is, um, it's an excellent uh, chronicle of what it was like to live through this period. The two extracts I've chosen here on the 15th and the 16th of April relate to the killing by the IRA of Major John McKinnon, who was the commander of the auxiliaries in Trelay. McKinnon was uh, an easy target because he was very flamboyant, carried himself with a swagger, and also the fact that he had killed two unarmed IRA men in a raid in Ballydwyer and Ballymacalligat um, on Christmas night, 1920. Um, McKinnon was killed on the golf course in Oak Park, shot twice through the head by a rifle, and his body was riddled with um, shotgun fire. So the extract on the 15th uh, reads as follows. Very exciting day. Major McKinnon was shot at the links today. Saw the poor man being brought up covered in blood and his head in bandages. He is dead. Oxy's made all shops shut at 5.30. Ran into our place about 10, drunk, but left when they saw the soldiers. As I write, we are expecting reprisals and are very anxious. I've I have my fiddle in my room. Mr. Porter, in early in the day, took the bullets from his revolver and gave it to me for a while. Mother was frightened. Now, just a bit of background. Christy was living at... Uh, 22 Upper Castle Street, where his family owned a shop and a restaurant. They moved around the corner to Ash Street in August 1921, 
when they bought the Ashbourne Hotel there. So both premises were frequented by members of the IRA, by the Black and Tans, by the Auxiliaries, and the British Army. So Christie was in a, a prime position to um, pick up information. It helped that he looked so young and innocent. This photograph was taken when he was in his mid-twenties, and he still looks like he's in school. But in fact, he joined the IRA um, just before his 16th birthday, and he was heavily involved in intelligence work and scouting duties. Um, and just a few uh, points to note in that first extract. The Mr. Porter he mentions was a driver with the auxiliaries, and he was one of Christie's regular um, sources of information. And his observation of the wariness shown by the drunken Oxies um, of the soldiers is also interesting. It's, because it's easy to lump them all together, RIC, Black and Tans, Auxiliaries, British Army, but there were um, frequent tensions between them which occasionally erupted in violence. And another point to note is Christie's protectiveness uh, of his fiddle. He was an extremely talented musician, um, later studying music in London, in Paris, and at the Juilliard School in New York. So he was obviously worried that the fiddle would be smashed in any reprisal by the auxiliaries. Um, the second extract reads, uh, the first, it begins, all shops shut today, shutters up, but business went on. A few shots fired in streets during day. how he could have said anything at all. Avenge McKinnon's uh, killing, setting fire to Ballydwire Creamery, raiding a number of houses, including the family home of Morris Reedy, one of the men McKinnon had killed on Christmas night. They also raided, raided Reedy's house, uncle's house, shooting him dead um, as he tried to escape. But then the extract goes on to say, went to pictures so you're fired, dealt of a chap who, to win his girl, stayed in a job for a month without being fired. Also saw first episode of The Invisible Hand. Soldiers fired shots in streets at night. So, you see, regardless of how turbulent the day might have been, Christie rarely missed a trip to the cinema. When he was living in Castle Street, it was only a few doors down. He went practically every night and recorded every film he saw along with a one or two line synopsis. He was a teenager after all and his diary is full of accounts of dances, music sessions, card games, girls he fancied, alongside the more violent and terrifying episodes. And I think it's a, it's, it's a good reminder to us because we think, tend to think of this period as being um, all about ambushes, raids, one uh, violent episode after another. <clears throat> but everyday life went on side by side with all of this, um, making Christie's diary such an interesting glimp glimpse into life uh, in this period. Um, the diary goes on, uh, to continues into the first few weeks of January 1922, with Christie describing his response to the ratification of the treaty by the Dáil with the words, no jubilation, as in my opinion, the free state is a bosh. Um, shortly afterwards, he joined the anti-treaty forces in Dublin and was arrested there in November 1922. He was uh, subsequently interned in Hare Park and was released in December 1923. He came back to Tralee and focused on his music um, being he heavily involved in the Tralee Musical Society and travelling to, to further his musical uh, education. He died uh, quite young at the age of 39 from lung trouble, presumably TB. Um, but we're very fortunate to have his diary, which gives us such a layered and nuanced um, insight into the world in which he lived. Now, <clears throat> some objects have the power to evoke an immediate response. And so it is with the next object, the shirt that Stephen Fuller was wearing the night he was blown up in Ballycidi uh, on the 7th of March. And as we know, he was the sole survivor. Now, as tangible things, objects have the capacity to make um, history real. And I think with all the gallons of ink spilt over Ballycidi in the past century, Nothing will ever make it as real and make what happened as real or as immediate as this. As we can see, the shirt is pretty badly damaged, particularly on the right-hand side. 
suggesting that this was the side that took the force of the blast. On the back are um, numerous small holes consistent with the account of the doctor who of his back. Right. Um, Fuller was blown uh, clear and he managed to make his way to a house from where he was taken to a dugout, seen to by Dr. Shannon of, of Farron 4. He was then taken to the Dawley's house in Cunicon Coulteen. They were a well-known Republican family and um, Stephen Fuller remained there for several days before moving on to another um, safe house. Um, the shirt remained behind and has been kept in the Dolly family for the last hundred years. And I'm going to stay uh, with the shirt rather than follow Stephen onwards or to go back to, into the whys and wherefores of the overall Ballyfeedy story. Because from a material culture point of view, what is interesting here is why the shirt was kept. I mean, it would have been in a pretty bad state um, when Stephen Fuller was brought into the house, torn as it is now, but also blackened and bloody. So why keep it? Now, I think it would be very easy and very tempting to say that the shirt was kept as a kind of sacred relic, but the story is a little bit more complicated than that. And I think we have to, you know, think about this. We, we've had a hundred years of hearing the Ballyseedy story and it still has the power to shock us. But to imagine yourself back in that house in Conacon that night, hearing this for the first time, it must have been incredibly um, shocking. How, you know, they're the people, here they are trying to get their heads around what Stephen Fuller is telling them. Did this really happen? Did it really happen? And of course, Stephen Fuller himself is the witness to it, and so is his shirt, bearing the traces of what had happened that night. So I think. The first instinct was to keep it as evidence. But then, while the Dollies were absorbing all of this um, and the horror of this, the word came through that one of their sons, Charlie, was dead, executed by a Free State firing squad in Drumbo, County Donegal. He'd been active um, in the northern counties from 1921. He was captured in Donegal in November 22, he was court-martialed and found guilty in January 23, but not executed until the 14th of March, seven days after Ballyseedy. So the Dollies now had their own tragedy to deal with and a son and a brother to grieve for. The shirt was, you can imagine, in the midst of this, um, put away, still in the state it had been when Stephen Fuller arrived in the, in the house. And this was done not in an act of forgetting, because the importance of it as a direct connection to Ballyseedy was never forgotten, but more, I think, that they weren't quite sure what to do with it in the midst of their own grief. Some years later, it was taken out and watch, washed by Charlie Dolly's younger sister, Nancy. Um, she was one of the younger members of the family, and she was a child when the family home was raided by the British Army in 1920 and set on fire. Around the same time, one of her older sisters died of TB, then Ballyseedy, the arrival of Stephen Fuller of the house, closely followed by the news of her brother's execution. For her, the shirt had taken on a terrible significance. With its stains, its rips and its tears, it came to symbolize for her all those traumas of the 1920s. So as an adult in the 1940s, she felt compelled to wash it. I mean, the symbolism of it possibly trying to wash the past clean. So the shirt was put away again, and there it remained in the house in Cunicon, Coulteen, until it came into us as an object, and is coming into us now as an object that, correct, collects, that connects us directly with two families, not just the Fullers, but also the Dawleys and the traumas that they endured, but both families endured. So I'd just like to pay tribute to both the, the Fullers and the Dollies for allowing it to be displayed and for sharing their family stories and their memories. 
Um, our next object takes us forward in time to the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, it's a Free State passport. It belonged to Johnny Reardon, who was the goalkeeper of the, Kerry, the famous Ferry Kerry football team in the 1920s. He traveled with the team on their um, highly successful tours of the United States in 1927, 31, and 33. This photograph um, is the football team in 1926, uh, and uh, Johnny Reardon is uh, the one circled there. And obviously the Kerry football team of that era was a powerful symbol of unity for the divided county with men of, from both sides of the, of the divide coming together for the sake of the team. Although, as Richard McElligot has, has, uh, has shown us, that in reality, the tensions between the two sides remained. And for instance, John Joe Sheehy, um, who I haven't ring there, but he's in the center of the photograph, took the opportunity of the trips to America to smuggle Thompson guns back into Kerry in the kit bags of some of his teammates. Um, Johnny Reardon was a close neighbor of Sheehy's in Bora Bay, fought alongside him in the War of Independence um, and the Civil War when both obviously took the anti-treaty side. And it's interesting to speculate how far their commitment to the Kerry team would have extended had they been forced to travel to America on passports identifying them as British subjects. And that was a very real possibility because the issue of passports was a hot topic between the Irish and British governments throughout the 1920s. The Oath of Allegiance, such a fundamental, such a fundamental issue leading to the Civil War divide, referred to the common citizen, citizen, citizenship of Ireland with Great Britain. So in theory, Irish people remained British subjects, which was such a red line for so many in Ireland. While the British government conceded that each dominion had the right to issue its own passports, it was, to deter it was determined to ensure that the passports would identify the holders as British subjects. They were afraid what failure, uh, that failure to use those words would have an impact in other parts of the empire. But the Irish government knew that this was never going to get any support in Ireland, even amongst those who had supported the treaty. So after two years of dancing around each other, in April 1924, the Irish government uh, started to issue passports describing the bearer as a citizen of the Irish Free State and the British Commonwealth of Nations. And this is the passport that Johnny Reardon traveled to America on. And even though this might have rankled, the alternative was worse. And the Irish government weren't prepared to back down, even when it was pointed out to them that this was hardly going to um, do anything to conciliate uh, the people in Northern Ireland or, or uh, provide any sort of reconciliation, or when the British authorities refused to recognize Irish Free State passports and de denied consular facilities to the bearers of them. But by the late 1920s, this was beginning to cause a lot of difficulties for Irish passport holders. So a compromise was reached in 1930. The bearer was, was now described as one of his majesty's subjects of the Irish Free State and the British Commonwealth of Nations. But ultimately, all of that went in 1939. All references to the king were dropped and the bearer of an Irish passport was now simply a citizen of Ireland. Just showing us that the theory of the treaty was one thing, what happened in practice was quite another. Now I'm sneaking in one last object, which uh, is actually the 11th object in our exhibition, the building itself, the Ash Memorial Hall right beside us. So the ground we're on here in Chimsa today, along with the plot that the ash sits on, the whole of the town park and the Brandon Car Park, once formed part of a larger parcel of land that was in private hands for 700 years. First with the Earls of Desmond, then the Denny's, and very briefly at the end with the Finnerty family. In March 1922, it was sold to Trilly Urban District Council. So after seven centuries, it moved from uh, being the private domain of the elite to a public space freely accessible to all, something that was enthousi enthusiastically welcomed in the town. In uh, June 1922, Kerry County Council decided to build their new headquarters on a site on this ground with the compensation money they'd received from the Shaw Commission after the original county hall in Godfrey Place had been burned by the Black and Tans in November 1920. But rather than build on the original site, the council decided to situate it here, as I've outlined on the map. 
Denny Street would be extended and terminate with the new County Hall. Now this was going to be one of the biggest changes to the landscape of the town centre since Denny Street had been developed a century before. But there was a reticence about articulating uh, what a bold statement this was about the transfer of power from the old regime to the new. And that was, of course, because the struggle over who controlled the new regime was about to erupt in the Civil War. So it was really only after the building was finished and opened in 1928 that its, that significance began to realise. Um, and it was expressed wonderfully by the Dean of Kerry, Monsignor O'Leary, on the opening night on the 27th of April 1928, when he said, the place in which we are assembled this evening is, a historic, is historic ground, for the county hall might be considered the natural substitution for the place from which justice was administered and laws delivered in the past. It was the land of the Geraldines of old. Then the power passed into the hands of the Denny family. Our present county council might be considered the successors of these great men. There was only one thing wanting in those days, and that was the absence of the representation of the people. Today, the County Council is elected by the people, and through them, the people are the rulers of their own destinies. So you gotta hand it to the church. They really can pull it out when, when it's needed. So reaching far into the past, he had created a lineage for the building from which it, it could draw power and authority, and which was now vested in the people. And it was in this building that the elected representatives of the people from both sides of the Civil War divide had to sit down together and participate in the running of a self-governing democracy, the achievement of which, in the end, was what all the fighting had been about. So it is a building that is in itself an artefact, symbolizing in stone the changes that had been wrought in Kerry in the decade into which it came into being. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Helen. Okay, so we've got um, about 20 minutes for questions and the usual procedure. There's a roving mic, so there's a question here at the very front. I want to thank all three speakers, but uh, in particular, um, uh, Professor Walsh at the start. There's just one point of detail which I wonder um, hasn't quite been resolved. I think you mentioned that you thought Edward Graney, who in fact is my uncle, uh, was 21 when he died. Well, his mother, my grandmother, uh, survived a shipwreck off the New Zealand coast in 1894, which suggests that he was nearer 30. And to further complicate the matter, uh, on the death certificate, he's written as an age of 25. So I think um, there's some confusion, but I, I, think, I think he's near 30. And could I ask um, Mr. McNaughty a question? Was the church actually monolithic in its position uh, about the free state? I mean, clearly the bishops together said something, but was there a local sympathy among local priests uh, on the ground? The mic is there. Yeah. Um, no, it, the hierarchy, well, it, it was, I mean, I would see the, the church as I would see it today as, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's essentially a class division in the church. I mean, if you look at it today, you have the hierarchy at one side, and then you have people like, uh, with several, like if you look at the homelessness, I mean, the church has led the way on dealing with the homelessness in Ireland. I mean, it's been to the forefront of that, you know, the Capuchins, um, Sister Stan, Father Pete McBerry. That was the same in them days. It was exactly the same. But you did have some elements, like the, clerk, the, the priest that um, Seamus O'Connor was uh, basically threatening to kill. He was, an old, he was a parish priest, so that the, even at that level there were, there were priests who were siding up with, with the, um, the establishment. But at another level you had priests who were sympathetic to the Republican cause and, and, um, and were more, um, there was a distance. And there was, um, I mean, I think what's interesting about that whole period is that um, the, 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 the notion that there was, that, that um, people were, were, like there was, there was a member of Kumana Man who refused to go to, to Mass. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a major statement, really. And there was, um, 
I mentioned um, there, there were other acts of defiance as well. So, um, I mean, threatening to kill a priest is a big deal, like even today. So that it wasn't, I mean, what's interesting is that defiance was there then, you know. And, um, but yes, there were priests who were, who were on the site. Like, you, you, if you go back, the Capuchins are quite interesting because in 1916, they went in to meet the, 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 um, the, one, the, the leaders who were being executed, whereas the Catholic Church at the time disowned them at that time. So, yeah, that's, there is that division. Well, a lot of them were uh, a lot of them were excommunicated. So we're going to get anything. <laughs> okay, over there on 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 the left. This is um, well. They got in touch with us. Um, very simple. Um, uh, not that long ago, and um, um, it's come into us on loan for. Um, well, probably just extended the loan now. So. Um, yeah, I think there was, um, it wasn't that it was kept secret, but it also wasn't broadcast, if you know what I mean. Um, and I think they, they have been um, very good custodians of it, um, because it, it is very easy to make it a sensational object. Um, and that's why I, I was very careful to to, you know, in, the, in the, their telling to me of the story of how it was kept and um, just asking them, you know, did they see it as a relic? And they, they didn't. Um, but it had, over the years, become so bound up with their family history that it's now inseparable from the, the, uh, the, the story of that object. Do you know, and that's why I was saying that all these layers of information that an object can have. Um, but that's, I mean, we um, would that I had the budget to go out hunting and buying stuff and all the rest of it. But so we are very dependent on um, people placing their trust in the museum as somewhere that is a safe repository for the material heritage of Kerry. Um, and, and I'm very glad that they have placed that trust in us. I hope that answers the question, Richard. <laughs> okay, up there on the right. Um, listen, to, uh, Dr. Walsh there earlier about the incident in Kishmelkin. We live right next to it, but there just, a few, just a few things there about that. Um, that uh, as girls, the, civil, uh, the Red Cross were there to rescue the body of two free states. Soldiers that were injured and killed there, and when the arrow lines was shot and rope snapped and rope cut, there was nobody there to rescue him. So I think it was a bit, a bit there was very much uh, the, 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 Repu the, the volunteers and the Republicans were, were treated very badly. And in fact, it was a young mine from my mother's side, like Loch Mickey Connor and uh, Handelman and uh, a Haley man that, that found that found him uh, in the sea uh, ten days after, and and they brought it and they brought him ashore. But uh, and you know as regards Jim McGrath, they are like uh, being being uh, kind of scapegoated. Well, no, I'm not saying that Doctor Wells said that, but Jim McGrath was kind of mentioned that you know he led him there. But the fact of the matter is that in 1943. His father, Peter, willed him the farm. And like, if you think now that if, if a father thought that he betrayed his son, his other son, I don't think he'd will him the farm. And uh, in fact, that farm is still in, 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 in dispute. Sadly, that, that, that family were, 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 were suffered the, worst, the most of all with Liz McGrath, Got so affected by her, bro her brother's and, and uh, death that in, uh, she, she finished up in mental hospital in 19, uh, and, and died in 1955. And all the other, the other, the, uh, Mike, 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 Mike Ian and Marianne, and uh, they, they, they were always going, going to the sea and looking out, hoping that they might get their brother, their brother's body. And 
Margaret went to America and married a man from, uh, from Stryko, I think. And she only did there, there about 20 years ago or less. And uh, she was very, 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 very um, put about, about how, how the, 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 far, the family were treated and treated very badly. In fact, I was the last person to speak to Jim McGrath on the 29th of January, 1972. Lovely, innocent man, and going to mass on that morning, uh, uh, and and uh, going through the fields, and as as we know, back in those days, people young or old, you, you made the you made the effort to go to mass, and if he had been going by the road, he probably wouldn't be. But yeah, uh, they, they, they were a lovely family, and uh, I'm sitting here near near, near Doctor Welch's uh, father, and I'm, I'm very I'm very proud of of the, her presentation here this morning. Very, very, very proud of it. Thank you very much for, for that and for giving us that, that, um, more greater insight um, into the family and, and what happened to them, them afterwards. Um, it really is a very sad story with the McGrath family, which I say the um, um, one sister ended up um, being, being committed to hospital very soon after. Um, and um, so many of the children from the family emigrating, um, and um, the family had already lost some children in, in early childhood um, before 1923, so it was sort of loss built on one another. Um, and certainly with Jim McGrath, you know, there's no suggestion that um, he knew, knowingly gave away his brother's location or the others, you know, he did not believe that they were at the caves when he, when he was um, forced to give up that information it was, an, it was a possible hiding place, but he didn't think that they were there, and he had been, um, um, the, you know, basically beaten into giving any information at all. Um, but I think, you know, the, the him, the lasting effects for him afterwards were all that he'd witnessed over that time, and just been unavoidably caught up in it. Um, and as I say, you can see the sort of the lasting legacies um, for for decades afterwards, and the. The challenges is that the family faced over time. So, thank you very much for, um, for that contribution. Greatly appreciate it. Over there on the left. Just two questions. One to Fanola. In regard to Clash Malcolm, uh, all the presentations were excellent. But in regard to Clash Malcolm, I noticed that you, uh, on your slides there, you portrayed the Tragedies of Carries from the GPO and the other little booklet. But I noticed, or maybe I didn't catch it, that you omitted to mention that there are two memorials at Clash Malcolm. And what is the significance of that in the context of what we heard yesterday about memorials and in the context, for instance, that for Bally Seedy you now, there are three or four groups feel that they have the correct interpretation of what happened uh, for the commemoration this year. So uh, that's on the memorial. On to Kieran. On the uh, question of the expectations of the working class during uh, the 1920s and in a, a lot of cases, as we know, James Connolly came to Tralee and he addressed the Trades Council in Tralee. And I think a lot of the landless people and the working class had aspirations for a Soviet type of uh, ideal in Ireland in the 20s. Were they betrayed by republicanism? In the 70s, the slogan went out that the 70s would be socialist, and the Labour Party gained great ground here in Kerry. I think the working class situation, both in the UK and Ireland, hasn't changed dramatically. So, Kieran, can you prophesize when the next wave will be? <laughs> um, so, the two memorials is something actually that I'm trying to find a little bit more about at the moment, and to exactly how they um, they each developed. But there's there's one closer to to the cliffs, um, to to the to of the, um, of the tragedy um, and one a little bit more publicly accessible. Um, but certainly they each list the names of those who died 
um, and um, you know it's it's possible that one is more connected to one of the families um, um, and the other more politicized. Um, but that is, um, I say, something that, that I'm, I'm very eager to find a little bit more information about. So if anybody has any, please please contact me afterwards on that. Yeah, um, you could probably write a thesis on what you've just asked there. <laughs> um, I, I think, what, I mean, it's true, Connolly came to Tralee and he spoke in the square here in 1915. It was literally a few months before the Easter Rising. I think part of the reason he was coming here was he knew what was going on, the plans for the Rising were happening. And they needed to organize the workers here, like at the docks in FINA and on the railways and so on, to, trans to, to transfer the arms which would be landed at FINA all the way up the west coast. And so they would need railway workers and dockers to do that. And if they were unionized, um, and, well, the, the, there was the National Union of Railwaymen and there was also the Transport and General Workers Union. That would be an aid, right? But, uh, but it's also to recruit. And there were bread and butter issues there as well. And there were rising prices. And that was affecting workers' incomes. Um, 3,000 actually appeared on the square in Tralee and heard Conley speak. And um, there was a strike going on here at the same time at the Munster Warehouse, which went on for over three years. There was 18 workers on strike. Uh, that was the predecessor to the Mandate Union. And um, um, Lahan, I can't remember his first name, he was there as well speaking. But on your broader question, um, you see, the problem really is, I, I mentioned it there, is that what the, the Labour Party was a dormant organisation when Connolly and Larkin, um, Larkin was in America and, and, and Connolly was in, um, Connolly had been executed, and they didn't leave behind them a functioning political party. That came later. So that gave the ground then for Sinn Féin to assume the leadership of the liberation movement. And the, the, the people who led the labor, the labor movement after Connolly had gone were not of the same stripe as him. And they, um, they saw their role basically to support the, the struggle for the Republicans, like the general strike to release prisoners against conscription, and also to, um, uh, you know, there was the railway boycott. But I mean, an interesting thing is if you look at uh, what happened in December 1920, which I said there, when martial law came in, they called off the railway boycott or any other form of industrial action. I mean, if they were real revolutionaries, they carried on. And they never really challenged Sinn Féin to the leadership of the, of, of the liberation struggle. So, um, I mean, their project really was to be part of the new state, which is what they did do. And when they went into Dyler, is what I was arguing there, essentially, um, they, that, that was where, you know, they were, they, were, they were accepting the parameters they were working under. And the project of a workers' republic was, was real rhetoric. Um, but, like, really, it's the nature of the Labour, the Labour Party, at, even at that time. It was, it was heading towards being a constitutional party, not a revolutionary party. And I mean, they, just on the last point there about Soviets, I mean, what was happening in, there were kind of Soviets in Ireland, but you can't use Russia as a model because they, they really had no idea what was going on there. So the circumstances in Ireland were, were quite different. I mean, communications aren't like what they are today. So it was quite separate there. But I mean, the really, the, the fact is that they never really developed a political party at the time capable of, of challenging and wanting to challenge for the leadership of the, liber of the liberation movement in Ireland that would bring about, unlike the, the Republicans, that would bring about changes for ordinary working people. It wouldn't just be symbols, it would be actual material change. So anyway, I'll leave it that. Okay. Any more questions? Up there on the right. I must say I really enjoyed this morning's papers and um, I'd like to ask Helen O'Carroll a question. And um, I found your paper really interesting and a very different approach. But um, I'm, I, and particularly the concept of the layers of, of history attached to the objects which you presented so, so well. But I'm curious as to what, um, what, what, what sort of approach you used in devising your exhibition and was it driven by the objects that you had available? I know you've only showed a very small um, selection of them here, or was it, um, a, a, were you try, trying to develop an approach as the Kerry County Museum to represent all sides in, in the conf various conflicts of the period over that 10 year um, time of, of a critical history? Um, Thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, in the first place, our, um, 
criteria, it, really some very practical considerations. Um, first of all, money. Um, very practical consideration, how much we have to spend. Um, also, um, what it's the, sp the location of the exhibition will be in um, the permanent gallery of the museum. So this, this exhibition is not temporary. It's going to be there for, well, as permanent as anything gets in the museum world, perhaps the next 10, 15 years. Um, and that means that defines the space that we have. Um, and it also, um, because it's sort of coming towards the, at the end of the gallery, of the, of the main gallery, which starts in the Neolithic. So we're very conscious that for visitors, they've waded through millennia of Kerry archeology span and history by the time they get to it. So um, um, that kind of informed our thinking in terms of keeping it simple, because, you know, sometimes less is more. And, we know from torrents of museum research that the more information you give people in a museum, the less they read, because they're standing up as they're going around. And museum burnout happens very, very quickly. So, um, so that, that was that. Then the other consideration, you're dead right, was what we had within our own collection. Um, and it was looking at those. And then really, um, it wasn't, it was kind of going where the objects were taking us, were we uh, looking at some of the major stories, obviously like Bally Sidi or um, stories from the War of Independence, but also some um, that mightn't immediately, um, um, that mightn't immediately be obvious. You know, um, I, well, I'm giving the game away now. I'm going to tell you about another object. Um, one of them is, uh, it's a tennis trophy. And it's a trophy won for tennis by a mixed doubles pair of Willie Quinlan and his, um, well, she was his fiance first and then his wife, Linda Keller. And the interesting thing about it is the trophy was won um, every year, 1920, 21, and 22. And those were the years that Willie Quinlan was the county secretary. And as county secretary, trying to keep the county council going through enormously difficult period um, when, you know, the Dáil instructed the, all of the county council officials, do not deal with the local government board anymore. We're now setting up an alternative administration with not a bob to rub between them. The money still had to keep coming in. They had to safeguard the council funds. Half the, most of the councillors were on the run. Um, so they were having council meetings on the hoof, basically. Um, and Willie Quinlan was under, you know, the same risk of arrest and imprisonment as people who were actually, you know, in arms. Because if he was caught running a, a, a council election, he would have been arrested and was actually brought up in court martial more than once in Ballymullen. So um, what I found interesting was, at the same time, he had time to play uh, tennis, which is obviously a, a, a stress reliever for him, you know. But that story of the, um, of the local authorities uh, keeping going isn't one that we normally hear about. And I have to, I mentioned to him yesterday, I have to thank Ma Dr. Martin Manzer for um, in, inspiring that thought some years ago at a seminar um, that I attended that he gave. And when the cup came into us then, and I realized that it was Willie Quinlan's, I thought, my God, this is the, 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 the opportunity to tell that story. So um, we weren't um, excessively, um, obsessed with balance, I have to say. It was really what, we're, what we were presented with and what would tell the best story and that people would engage with. I hope that answers the question. <laughs>